Hi, everybody. Can you hear me through this? Not just because I'm shouting. OK. All right. Good. Um, so this is the title of my talk, Designing for Radical Openness and Possibility in the Learning Sciences. And I am taking a little bit of a risk here. I have never written about these particular ideas before. So um, be kind. Be kind. OK. All right. So one of my mentors used to say that within every theory, lies a biography. So I think this is true, and I think that as our biographies evolve, so do our theories. In that spirit, in my talk today, I'm going to reflect on work that I have already completed, but on which I'm looking back with new eyes, changed through significant and challenging personal, professional, and socio-historical events that have forced me to see new meaning in my biography in the work I've done, and its import for studying and theorizing learning. So for an audience of graduate students, my message is this. Expect change in your thinking. Be open to it, even though it may be painful and hard. And if you can, and I am in this space myself right now, try to use it to better understand who you are, what you're doing, why, and for whom. So I grew up in New York in the 1970s and 80s. My parents, new immigrants from India, were eager for me and my older sister to assimilate to US culture so that we could become successful in the new country. Assimilation also involved covering, to the extent that we could, what made us different in order to fit into a vision of the model minority that was created by and upholds white supremacy. Although he desired assimilation, my father was also deeply irritated at how we, me in particular, were becoming increasingly Americanized, which to him meant disrespectful. As I often reminded my parents, I was American. I was the only member of my family who had been born in the United States, and I saw it as my right to demand freedom, self-expression, and justice. At home, I was too American. At school, I was not American enough. I found that I could fit in sometimes when I was allowed, but at other times, I absolutely did not. There were some things that were OK for me to accomplish as an Indian girl, as long as I stayed in my place and showed gratitude for the opportunities I was getting. But other things were off, limit, off limits or not appropriate. These days, I have felt the limits on my actions even more strongly as a professional, middle-aged woman of ambiguously brown background. <laughs> Although officially, according to the US Census in 1970, the year I was born, I was white. I was not white. Ten years later, the census reclassified Indians as Asian, or as however we wanted to identify. Like Sharmila Sen reflects, as an Indian, I was both not white and not quite not white. This sense that I had of not being easily classified, of not being, not being fully seen, is a feeling that has always been with me and shapes what I notice and think matters. When I first studied feminist theories in graduate school and came across, in particular, this quote from Bell Hooks, I realized that my liminal position could be, a generative, uh, a gen could be generative and a source of strength. She writes, I am located in the margins. I make a definite distinction between that marginality which is imposed by oppressive structures and that marginality one chooses as site of resistance, as location of radical openness and possibility. My experiences of marginality and of being gatekept, particularly related to my race and my gender, have profoundly shaped my research, methodology, and designs. My experiences have led me to develop a disposition towards this work that has led me to notice complexity, to be attentive to the dynamics that shape social situations, and to have an abiding commitment to understanding how we can organize for greater justice. 
This disposition has deepened in the past couple of years as I have felt in a more profound way the effects of being othered in spaces where I had previously felt secure and at home. Today I'm going to speak about the aspiration of my learning sciences research to become a location of what Hooks describes as radical openness and possibility. Imagine what radical openness and possibility might mean for us as learning scientists. What is it about our current systems and structures that we wish we could change? What would we do if we did not feel constrained by the expectations of our advisors, our field, our institutions? Radical openness and possibility signifies a generative space for liberty not only a freedom from oppression, but a space alive with continual engagement, play, and the remaking of cultural and historical relations that can create flourishing ways of being and becoming. Radical openness and possibility is fundamentally about learning, learning without bounds and without end. This type of learning has a deeply ethical dimension it is about creating new forms of life and ways of being with care and compassion with others in the world. This desire for radical openness and possibility is why I am a learning scientist. Learning scientists study and organize for learning that can generate new forms of knowledge, new ways of knowing, and support the development of people and institutions. Doing this serious and fun and playful work well demands that we work in deep relation with others and maintain humility in order to see and understand how others are developing towards ends that are not yet there. When I think about radical openness and possibility, I am often drawn to looking at and thinking about and thinking with art. It both inspires me and reminds me that I have permission and responsibility to think creatively. The work of the Fearless Collective demonstrates radical openness and possibility. Started in response to virulent rape culture and gender violence in India, a group of artists and activists decided to redefine fear femininity, and what it means to be fearless. In collaboration with communities, they identify issues that residents are facing, and together they create art that speaks back to violence with love, justice, and imagination. The work of the Fearless Collective is an example of the ways that regular people in the world are enacting Hooks' notion of radical openness and possibility. I'm using this example as a way of grounding what I imagine learning sciences research can be. Drawing inspiration from Uria Engström, this research can involve the exploratory creation of new ideas and practices and be oriented toward how things might or should be rather than how things are. This view of research has an explicit and strong ethical dimension. I believe that all research has an ethical dimension, but not all researchers are explicit about it. What would we gain if we were? What new questions could we ask? What processes could be made visible if we named our ethical commitments more directly? I have been interested in studying in activism as a site for studying and organizing consequential learning because of its focus on collective imagining for a different future. Being in spaces of activism has led me to ask, how can we organize spaces of radical openness and possibility? I have been fortunate to have colleagues with whom I have been thinking about this question and its possible answers. Some of them are here today in this room. Quentin Freeman, who's right over there, Lonnie Horn, and Rogers Hall, and others you'll see referenced in citations throughout my talk. I want to highlight in particular my collaborators, Chris Gutierrez, Molly Shea, and Leah Teeters. 
One way that we have been thinking about generating radical openness and possibility in our work has been through the development of social design experiment methodology. Social design experiments, which Chris Gutierrez and colleagues, including myself, have been developing for over two decades, is a different way of thinking about the purposes, processes, and outcomes of design in the learning sciences. Social design experiments begin from a place of hope and possibility, stemming out of the reality that there are many groups of people who have been and continue to be oppressed and harmed as a result of systemic injustice. Social design experiments involve working on problems with the people who have faced these injustices to address oppression directly. Social design experiments strive to make possible a dignified life for all humans. Address challenges of social inequality through leveraging cultural diversity. Are oriented toward the co-design of new futures. And focus on the greater theorization of learning as a social, cultural, and historical process. Designing for radical openness and possibility demands principled responsiveness to ever-shifting forms of power. Some of the arenas in which I believe we, as learning sciences researchers, need to develop greater sensitivity within this flow of ever-changing perspectives include being responsive to what we notice and our choices with regard to with whom we stand, how we act to revision and organize consequential change, and not only who we are, what we bring to situations from our histories, but also who we are becoming in our dynamic relations with people, places, and tools. So I'm gonna share how my team and I approach these issues in relation to one of my projects, the Learning in the Food Movement Project in order to draw attention to how being responsive in designs, in, in designs aiming for radical openness and possibility involves ambiguity, humility, and empathy. So our project on learning in the local movement for food access and social justice was organized to push on how learning scientists have conceptualized and investigated situated learning. It focused on the organization of consequential learning in a context in which knowledge and identity trajectories have neither been fully or firmly established nor highly valued. And my research team and I studied activities led by community members, not educators or researchers alone. Community organizing created through the actions of people challenging the status quo has great potential to create lasting and meaningful change. That said, the learning sciences had not, at the time we were doing that work, taken the explicit study of these kinds of on-the-ground movements as part of its research agenda. The community-based nonprofit that became the focus of our work is a group we call IMPACT. IMPACT was founded by two white men who grew up in the state and wanted to improve the, com the quality of life for their city's most marginalized populations. The co-founders served as IMPACT's executive director and the director of operations for the organization. There are pictures at the way top. Impact staff also included eight promotoras, seven women and one man from the community. The promotoras were all immigrants from Mexico who were primarily Spanish speakers, though they also spoke some English. The use of promotoras to advance public health was originally developed to help institutions like hospitals capitalize on the shared cultural practices and language backgrounds between promotoras and residents to facilitate desired health goals. Promotoras were seen as leaders and advocates, people who were trusted and highly regarded members of their community. Sorry, there's a wire here that I fear I'm going to trip over. I'm just gonna kick it out of my way. Okay. The use of promotoras um, was a historically established practice. 
So IMPACT initially focused their energies on improving access to healthy food in the neighborhood of what we call South Elm. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has categorized South Elm as a food desert because residents did not, have an easy, did not have easy geographical access to buying healthy and affordable food. IMPACT's most successful and long-standing initiative is its Backyard Garden Project. Through this initiative, residents are supported in designing and growing their own backyard vegetable gardens with educational material and relational support from the nonprofit. The Promotoras plan the gardens with the residents, prepare the ground for the gardens, and regularly attend to the gardens to help the residents grow a wide variety of vegetables and fruits. On their regular visits to the gardens, the promotoras also get to know their neighbors, the problems they're facing, and how they might assist them either directly or through recruiting resources from the nonprofit and other community organizations. Because this was a neighborhood without a lot of resources and a community without great financial means, there were many needs that were not getting met by established institutions. The social relational work that the promotoras were doing, which was not initially recognized by the nonprofit as part of the promotoras job, was fundamental for the success of IMPACT's community organizing efforts in South Elm. The organization was trusted because the promotoras showed up for residents. The success of the Backyard Garden program has been enormous. Since IMPACT began the program nine years ago, they have established more than 1,600 backyard gardens. Residents have produced over 500,000 pounds of organic produce for themselves and their neighbors. From a structural change perspective, IMPACT has worked with city, private, and national funders, along with residents, to develop a cooperative market where neighbors can sell their produce to others in South Elm and to residents in other parts of the city. So over five years during which my team worked with IMPACT, the organization had also grown, and its needs shifted during the time of our project. In relation to that, I played many different roles, sometimes at the same time. I was a researcher, a professional development designer and leader, and I became, on request of the Promotoras, a member of the IMPACT Board of Directors. The story of our research project, the neighborhood's changing circumstances, and my shifting role, as I will share, are deeply interrelated with each other. As a way of linking back to my biography, my experience with IMPACT and the Promotoras in particular has pushed me to see beyond the boxes through which promotoras and residents in the neighborhood are typically viewed. Outsiders often talk about the promotoras and the residents as poor and as undocumented Im immigrants living in difficult circumstances. The, that's true about them, but these are limited and static categories. Like me, the promotoras and the residents experiences, actions, and ingenuity are not easily captured by these simple classifications. What I plan to do next is show you how we tried to move beyond these classifications in our work with IMPACT. So we began our project with a broad ethnographic overview of the food movement in a three-city metropolitan area in the state where we live. What we noticed were that there were many groups focused on healthy and sustainable eating, and a smaller number of groups organized around food justice. According to the lexicon of food, food justice refers to a wide spectrum of efforts that address injustices within the U.S. food system. Weak forms of food justice focus on the effects of an inequitable food system while stronger forms of food justice focus on the structural causes of those inequities. About a year into our, like the broad phase, ethnographic phase of our project, we made a decision to focus on groups committed to strong forms of food justice. We spent about another six months analyzing the food justice dimension of the food movement in order to understand its variations and its contradictions. We also began to get to know the people who are part of the different groups and assess their willingness to allow us to learn more about their work. 
Based on systematic comparison across groups and writing about what we were learning, we decided to join in with IMPACT. We chose to work with IMPACT because they were the only group that at that time was leveraging the assets of the marginalized community that they were serving. Other groups were focused on what Julie Guthman describes as bringing good, fee bringing good food to others, wherein people working in white cultural spaces and from a missionary stance aimed to educate poor people of color about a particular set of valued food practices and bring them healthy food to which they believe poor people of color would not otherwise have had access. The orientation of impact, in contrast, centrally viewed the community as part of a solution aimed at structural reorganization. This was aligned with my team's aspirations and values around generating equity. The choices we made in this early phase of our project were value-laden and shaped the direction of our research. We identified a group of people and a dense set of practices that were already working toward radical openness and possibility. We joined in with them because we both wanted to learn how they were doing this work and how we might partner with them in achieving their ambitious goals. Our capacity to revision and organize consequential change with others relies on recognizing how we are connected to each other and seeing our lives and our struggles as linked. In our work with IMPACT, my team and I focused on the experiences and work of the Promotoras. We did this not only because our entry to the organization was focused on enhancing the professional development of the Promotoras, but also because we noticed the ways in which the Promotoras were working hard with minimal resources, for little money, and with significant positive effect on building solidarity and social change in the neighborhood. While our experiences the members of my team and I, our experiences, were, not, were certainly not the same as the Promotoras. Their experiences resonated with some of what we experience as a group of women trying to be successful in academia, a space that is full of contradictions and tensions around what and whose knowledge matters and whose experiences matter. We bonded with the Promotoras around feelings and experiences of injustice, not being fully seen or recognized for the complexity of our lives, and our hope for a better world. We used art, theater, and political activism activities and writing to learn more about their experiences. We did that as well as collected the kind of typical data that people collect to make sense of people's lives, like interviews and observations. My research team and the Promotoras leverage our diverse forms of expertise and our networks to engage in this joint work. The university team used our disciplinary training and professional experiences as designers, researchers, and teachers to organize interventions with the Promotoras. We strategically drew on our academic networks across disciplines, financial resources from our grants, and our social and cultural capital to enact responsible and sustainable plans. Likewise, the Promotoras drew on their networks of influence across the city and their expertise as gardeners, community advocates, and activists to initiate and revise designs for improving their professional practices. Together, we developed new data collection and analysis tools, new organizational structures that could support the Promotora's development and their advancement in the nonprofit. And we are also organized different ways of making visible and communicating the Promotora's worth to the nonprofit leadership and to the city more broadly. In terms of specifically creating designs for radical openness and possibility, my team and I used strategies that built on our assumptions about how the organization of social, material, and technical infrastructure makes particular knowledge, skills, and identities consequential. 
and how power is constituted through knowledge, method, and discourse. Our aim was to organize designs in which the promotoras could develop ways of knowing, being, and becoming that could support their increased capacities for self-determination and freedom from oppression. As an example of how our designs reorganize the relations between the social, material, and technical infrastructure to support radical openness and possibility at impact, let me share about the Promotora app. We co-designed the Promotora app, a tablet-based application, in collaboration with colleagues in the Department of Information Communication, Technology, and Development at CU Boulder. We did this to make visible the routine, yet unrecognized relational dimensions of the Promotora's work. What the Promotora's were doing in the community was not new. Engaging in reciprocal relations of care and commitment with community members is foundational to the traditional Promotora model. What was critical in our work with the Promotora's was that we were documenting that ordinary work of compassion and making it visible in spaces of power, authority, and decision making. We did this through using open data source digital technologies that were critically in the service of greater social justice. And, they were, and we were doing this with the sense of moving toward radical openness and possibility. Combining traditional practices with new technical practices is what Chris Gutierrez and I have called a syncretic approach to design, a strategy that leverages historically valued community practices and extends them into the future to create new possibilities. Prior to the use of the app, the promotors were using low technologies, pen and paper, to collect data on vegetable growth in the gardens and then giving this information to one of the nonprofit's directors, who then input the data in an Excel file located on a sole computer in the office. Because the promotoras were not responsible for using Excel or for coordinating the data, they were also not learning office, analytic, and management skills that they were very interested in developing. The data that were collected were restricted to information related to vegetable production in the gardens, leaving out the robustness of the, ex of the promotora's extensive work in, for instance, connecting community members to healthcare resources, supporting them to access services for domestic violence, and responding to sexual violence. The Promotora app was designed to allow for information about the Promotora's community advocacy to be collected and used to inform the nonprofit's initiatives in the neighborhood. Before we started our work with the Promotoras, this nearly invisible work was not officially discussed in the organization. It was not valued, and it was not supported with professional development. The Promotoras wanted to design the app so that it could help them collect information, basic information, about how they were interacting with residents in the neighborhood and what resources they could use to advance that work. Since the introduction of the Promotora app into the Promotora's daily practices, they have been able to harness new opportunities supported by the app to secure new community grants for their advocacy work. The first one they were awarded focused on their desires to end domestic violence in South Elm. They were using their voices and their power to end violence against women by intimate partners and to support education for creating new pathways for women's lives in the neighborhood. The Promotoras and our experiences designing and using the Promotora app resonate with Hooks's notion of radical openness and possibility. When she writes, we come to this space through suffering and pain, through struggle. We know struggle to be that which pleasures delights, and fulfills desire. We are transformed individually, collectively, as we make radical creative space, which affirms and sustains our subjectivity, which gives us a new location from which to articulate our sense of the world. 
Being transformed through organizing for radical openness and possibility is part of the work. It is an essential, though often overlooked, way in which we are learning. We don't often examine this process as part of our research stories, which are centered on our findings, but it is a significant motivating force behind what we do, how, and why. Critically reflecting on what changes us in our projects can alert us to how our ideological commitments and our ethical perspectives are developing and shaping our designs as well as their effects on the world. So with that perspective in mind, I want to share how I believe I have been transformed through doing this work. In an article I wrote with Leah Teeters, we described how relationships de confianza mediated the successful community organizing that was taking place in South Elm. Relationships de confianza are characterized by mutual reciprocity and commitment. They fundamentally involve listening and responding to the needs of others with whom you have strong interpersonal relations. In our analysis, the relationships de confianza that the Promotoras developed with residents served to build strong relational networks with, with community members, and that was the means by which the community-based change was able to spread. In thinking about our designs for radical openness and possibility, the notion of relationships de confianza is also helpful. The relationships de confianza that the Promotoras developed were not only with the residents of South Elm, they were also with us, the researchers. Through our sustained engagement with the Promotoras and IMPACT, we researchers came to be seen as trusted colleagues and friends. The Promotora app was one of the more spectacular ways in which we responded to the tensions and problems that the Promotoras were trying to address. But we, in relation to them, or with them, found other ways to develop understanding of their lives, to build solidarity with them around shared concerns, and to care for each other. We learned to listen to the Promotoras in a way that was similar to how they listened to residents. We listened in order to act. Our actions were guided by the Promotoras in a dialogue between what they believed they needed and how we thought we could respond. As one example, since we began working with IMPACT, the South Elm neighborhood has changed and it has become attractive to gentrifiers. IMPACT, ironically in some ways, has been a part of this development. South Elm now has a lot of beautiful and productive gardens, a cooperative grocery store selling the, the produce that was grown in the gardens, improved thoroughfares that include bike lanes and street lights, and a profusion of murals along main streets that were inspired by the community's pride and hope for their future. The city in which South Elm is located has also changed. The local food movement had a lot of momentum in the city where our project was located. New flows of money, people, and ideas contributed to the growth of the city to become a major destination for migration in the U.S. and for urban development. And South Elm, a largely poor and immigrant neighborhood with limited resources, but just 15 minutes from the city's downtown, has become newly attractive to people who would not have considered living in the neighborhood before. Gentrification has become a serious threat to the community's survival. Following Donald Trump's election, the problem of gentr gentrification was exacerbated by new concerns with deportation and community safety. As members of a largely undocumented population, South Elm residents' experiences with housing have become increasingly precarious. The Promotoras shared stories with us of corrupt landlords who were preying on residents because of their undocumented and unprotected status. As the nature of what was consequential to the community shifted, our research and my role in the community needed to shift as well. At that point, I accepted an invitation to work in collaboration with Promotoras and residents on a new housing campaign initiative, and I was asked by the board 
the Impact Board of Directors to lead a discussion on gentrification and its meaning for the community. And in this way, in this project, new agendas and new forms of participation in the life of the community have emerged and developed. Not all of these new directions developed into new research projects. The housing campaign work, for instance, did not. Part of identifying what would become an er arena for research and design included determining interests from the people involved, honestly assessing whether we had the time and resources to do the work well, and figuring out whether we, could, we had or could develop the necessary expertise to do the work. Another consideration for all of us, and this includes graduate students too, is whether we could do the work in a way that was oriented towards radical openness and possibility. This might mean not pursuing questions or solutions in ways that we, as researchers, wanted to. This is a significant concern because meaningful work with communities is not always what is taken as consequential in academia. Even when agendas did not become sites for research, they did contribute to deepening the relationships de confianza that grounded our partnership with impact and helped to ensure its continued meaning. In fact, when I look back on it, not always doing research may have been a wise research decision. It's notable that each shift in the project required my team to bring in new collaborators with expertise that could help us develop ways of responding to the newly named problems. We worked with technologists, business school entrepreneurs, and lawyers. Doing this led us to using different tools, methods, and strategies, which pushed us to appreciate new ways of thinking and acting for the future. This is characteristic of community organizing work in which the promotoras and impact were engaged. As researchers working towards equity, we learned, whoops, I'm gonna keep going, whoops. We learned from the promotoras how to participate in this type of principled improvisation rooted in clear ethical positions. The shifting nature of our research our designs, and our participation was a mirrored response to the shifting nature of injustices in South Elm. This movement within our project and ourselves speaks to what it means to work towards radical openness and possibility. This project changed me as a researcher as it has helped me sharpen and refine my understanding of the ways that contexts change and, this, and the effects that this can have on what and who matters. It has also changed me personally, as it has helped me feel in a different way than I had before, how oppression functions and changes its form over time and space, how it affects differently positioned people differently, differently, and how it demands that we act together fearlessly to challenge it. My research team and I did not organize our work by developing a precisely mapped out research plan. We did go into this project with an understanding of learning as a situated social practice, with an appreciation for diversity as a resource for learning, and a sincere willingness to embrace the unexpected and the serendipitous. We had strong ethical commitments to supporting our partners, capacities for self-determination, and relatedly, somewhat weaker commitments to, to developing particular designs. As I've suggested, doing this kind of design research raises ethical, methodological, and strategic career-making dilemmas. If we're interested in designing for radical openness and possibility, we need to name and grapple with the dilemmas that this work brings to our attention. If we don't, we are bound to reproduce structures, including disciplinary constraints and expectations that do not allow us to see and address the creativity and the humanity of feeling, thinking, and acting people. 
We are beginning to move in this direction with great people and my partners who I worked with at Impact and the Promotoras. There are people in this room here, including Lonnie and Quentin and Rogers, who have really helped me think about this work. Chris Gutierrez, my husband, Jordan Giroux, my dean, Kathy Schultz, Ed Taylor, they have nurtured these ideas and really let me be the person who I am. But most importantly, my doctoral students who are now finished, Professor Molly Shea and Dr. Leah Teeters, without their care and compassion and commitment to the project and to me, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this work. So thank you to all of them. Can I pull this out? Sure, I will take questions if there are questions. I can pull this out, right? Anything? Questions? Raj, I know you had a question, and you were waiting for it, but now I broke your whole groove, and yeah. You can still say it. We can still talk. Yeah. Yeah, we can still talk, and like, it should be a conversation amongst everyone, not just to me. You're on. We can hear you. hello again, is the way that the learning sciences in particular thinks about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is one of the most important thrusts of our community labor yeah. as a discipline. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about some of the tensions that you experience in terms of doing work that you either can't or don't explicitly want to link back to STEM disciplinary learning goals. Yes, thank you. That's not a planted question at all. Uh, <laughs> I've been waiting for that question since ICLS in London. Okay, so I think for those of you who study STEM, thank you, that's great. For those of us who don't do that, you also should do your work. And we should make space in our field for all kinds of work, for people who are studying literacy, who are doing the, working in the humanities, great, do that work. I think that I have, the feedback I have gotten when I was developing this project was, you know, if you added this science component to it, and you had young kids learning how to plant gardens and measure, you know, plant growth, you could get NSF money for this. And I thought, you know, probably Rogers knows me best because he's my graduate advisor. I was like, don't you tell me what to do, right? And I thought, but there's a real reason for that, which is I wasn't interested in that kind of learning. If somebody wants to do that work, good, great. Go work with a garden project and do that work. That's awesome. But not all of the work we do has to be funded by the National Science Foundation because when you do that, but there are tensions, right? Like, you do that, I do think you are part of, you know, you are playing a particular kind of game. That is fine, and I know lots of people who are getting money from the NSF and doing incredible work and pushing against some of the structures. However, there's other ways of getting money. There are other places you can go to get money for the things you need. And the question you should ask is like, why do you need the money? What, what do you need the money for? And Rogers, I know you're like, oh, Susan Giroux, you got funded throughout graduate school because of an NSF grant. And I do know that. But I have graduate students who are here today who I fund in different ways, right? And so I think that we need to think about, like, how are we beholden to some of these groups? And do we want to be? When the NSF defines a lot of the things we're doing, what are we buying into? And who are we leaving out? And, like, what's this work for? So, you know, other people might have perspectives on that, but I see the sweater over here, the woman in the sweater. Is it? Nope. Yes? 
So this may be a follow-up question to that, and maybe is a weird place to ask this question, but I'm... <laughs> Weirder the better. Great. Right. So I hear in your talk and in your discussion about how this work has changed you, um, something that I myself grapple with, mm -hmm. which is this question of where, are, where is our work the most influential? Uh, on what scale, on what time scale? And, and I hear you saying, well, there's all this incredible that work that we're doing that doesn't necessarily lead to research. And I also hear you saying, well, the socio-political situation both in this community and in our country at large is changing. Do you ever have the voice in the back of your mind that says, okay, so why am I in academia? Shouldn't I just go be doing activist work? And, and how do you answer that voice? Um, I know the, the answer for me, um, and that's because there's a lot more to do in academia than doing research, right? So because I have Ginny Logan and Quentin Freeman in the, like right here in front of me, I'm there, I'm doing this because of that. I'm doing that because of the relationships I get to develop with students who are going to make a difference in a variety of ways in the work that they do. So for example, like Quentin and I have discussed all the time, like, why do I have to be in schools? Me, that's me. And then Quentin fighting back to say, because so many children have to go to schools. We need to do better work in schools to support teachers and classrooms. And I'm like, okay, you can do that work, but I'm gonna do this other work. And I'm like, good, that's the kind of diversity we need. So I love to prepare students. I also think doing work in higher education, like high, institutions of higher education is important, and doing work in communities is important. Where else am I gonna get to do this kind of work? I get to do whatever I want all the time, and I get to write about it. I get to write. I know it's hard to find jobs where you can do this kind of thing, but academia is one of those places. And man, you're catching me on like a bad day. You know, I'm usually more enthusiastic about academia, but um, that's why I do it. I feel like I can do this work. Um, and I probably would do similar kinds of work wherever I was. What, what is, what's the voice in the back of your head saying, why don't you want to do it? Or maybe you are doing it, you're here. Not, I'm not always convinced that uh, I'm negotiating them, honestly. So I'm just curious whether, like, am, am I trying to wrestle STEM into the project because it seems like it's more fundable? I, am I trying to write about it in a particular way because it seems like it's going to get me a job? Or am I really being honest to the work that I'm trying to do? It's the same struggle. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really hard issue. And I think that you, when you think about where you're going to go and get a job, you should try to figure out what kinds of expectations are there in the institution. Where I work, it is more flexible, and I think that's good, and I think that part of what I'm doing, talking about how it shouldn't just be about STEM, is because I'm thinking about where my students are going to find jobs. I'm thinking about building relationships with people in other universities because I want them to be able to get jobs there, doing the work that they want to do and they think is important, right? And not just like figuring out how they're gonna get tenure. But getting tenure is really important, so get cracking. <laughs> Start typing. <laughs> what else? What? Suraj gets a second question because. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wildly different question, Susan. So um, a bunch of the Indian and Desi students here have been talking about that particular identity and what that means for our learning and thinking about that relationally to some critical race work and particularly work yeah. that seeks to target blah, 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 blah. And so thinking through what that specific kind of decolonization and diaspora means for approaching our critical social theory and research, wondering, it sounded like as you were talking, that has had new salience for you. Do you want to speak any more about that and what that might mean for the study of learning? Is there something analogous to the kinds of um, work towards decolonization that we're seeing from really great indigenous learning scholars, the work towards um, ameliorating anti-blackness that we're seeing from really good black learning scientists? Is there something that we as a community should be thinking about and doing, especially when people like Bobby Jindal and Nikki Haley and all the other Don't terrible Indian people? Don't name them in our talk, come on. 
This is our space, okay? Come on. Don't bring me down. I know, I broke the secret rule. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I mean, I will say, though, that I am thinking about a next research project that is more specifically looking at that. I don't think that, you know, and you, we're just having our, our conversation between us, like, out loud. I think that, you know, Indians are very different. India's a big place, right? People come from all sorts of different backgrounds. I didn't mention, like, I'm from, I'm not, people typically are like, oh, you're Indian. Well, and they make the assumption, I'm Hindu. I'm not Hindu. My parents have been Christians in India for a long, long, long time. We didn't, like, convert when we came to the U.S. And I think people don't recognize the diversity of being Indian. I think that I have had some new insights around what it means to be Indian. And the book, Not Quite What Not White, by Sharmila Sen, that's a really interesting book. I feel like she's killing me softly with my own song, right? I mean, it's like I'm hearing her and I'm like, oh my God, that experience of like not being seen and people just like not even caring what I am or telling me that I'm not, I mean, really, people have said this, I'm not the right kind of minority. I'm like, what is this? This is part of like white supremacy. You're trying to separate us all from each other so that we don't recognize that we're in this together. And I think that my own experiences and obviously in this current political context, it's like, I'm suffering too. It's time for me to organize with a lot of other different kinds of people. And I'm wondering what that means for Indians who are in the US, because I know from my limited lived experiences with certain groups that they don't see themselves as connect, Indians don't see themselves as deeply connected to the struggles of other minoritized groups in the US. So I'm gonna think about how I'm gonna organize that as a project, but I do think that there is activism amongst Indians in the US that Indians don't know about. And what would it mean to make that visible to like the next generation? And how could that support different forms of activism? So we'll see. What does that have to do with learning? I can always figure that out. You know, I can think on my feet. Well, changing forms of participation, I can keep looking back at like those foundational ideas. Joshua Danish, yes. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dang, Florin. Hello. Uh, thank you for an inspiring talk. Um, I've spoken with a number of people, particularly post-election, and, and a number of them in here in this room right now, who want to do equity-oriented work with communities that they do not directly come from, mm -hmm. uh, but they want to do that and approach that and, and, and be respectful and mindful and, and maintain uh, an orientation towards being respectful that I think you spoke quite a bit about in your talk. So I'm wondering if you can offer advice to anyone who does want to do work with a community they didn't come from uh, and, and how to approach that and, and sort of stay in that respectful position and, and to check themselves continuously. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that is a hard one. And I feel like when I started this project, I didn't know who, like, I didn't know what group we were going to work with. Like I said, we went in thinking, like, we're going to look at a social movement. And then we kind of came to impact and that community. And I liked what they were doing. And I was just saying this to Priyanka that, like, it felt like, it was like figuring out, like you're getting married to somebody. It's like, are you, do you like what we could bring to this? Like, do you like us, you trust us? And we spent a lot of time just doing that in the beginning. And they liked us, you know? And so I felt like they saw a way that we could give back to their organization. And we felt like we'd learn a ton from hanging out with them. And I remember, I know Megan was here yesterday. I remember Megan came and gave a talk at CU Boulder, 
and in front of my team, you know, my team was there, and she said, you know, you shouldn't be doing this work if you're not, like, from the community. I think she has slightly different ideas about this now. And my team all looked at me like, oh, my God, like, do we need to stop? And I was like, I disagree, you know. I don't think, I think you can do this work, and you can do it well, but it will be different if you're not of the community. Um, we definitely connected on a lot of other levels. And that, I mean, I put up, you know, this, I had this conversation with you about not being in these boxes. I am so much more than being an Indian woman. I'm so much more than that. And I also am like around connecting around being women who have been like oppressed in the institutions where we work. I have that experience. We definitely bonded over that. We bonded over being mothers. We bonded over so many other things. Plus, my parents were immigrants. I was a child of immigrants. I understood the like feel like how they were networking with each other. And so we connected in other ways. But I write about the things I know about. I don't write about like ways in which like I share their exact experiences. And nobody shares the exact experiences with anybody. So, like, we need to be talking about that in more complex ways. And I do feel like we don't, we need to have lots and lots of examples of doing this kind of work so that we can really dig into, like, well, what are the ways in which these are different from each other? What does it mean for our, for our positionality? So, that's not, you know, it's a roundabout way of answering because that's my style. <laughs> it's a radical openness and possibilities. So. <laughs> So, so okay. pushing uh, for my name's Trey, uh, a third year student now. I'm um, thinking about um, equity in your talk and equity here, and how that, like that word, and how you've thought about it. Has that has that changed over time? I'm assuming it has. And I'm yeah. thinking a lot going back to the STEM question, a sort of like. You know, the project you're talking about is not about saying, oh, we have these practices and we want you to use them and these practices, all people should use them and that's our equity frame, right? Your equity frame is very different. Yeah. And so just could you like hammer that home for us? And I'm sure that got hammered home some yesterday, but like I think that's something as young scholars, mm -hmm. like we need to keep thinking about. It's not about just like, you know, showing you these, these cool practices and tools so you can pick them up. Um, you're yeah. approaching this very differently. Well, it's funny. I didn't, you know, I... I was talking to Chris Gutierrez, who's been a partner in some of this work, right? And I was like, I'm not going to say designing for equity. Equity was in my talk, but radical openness and possibility was what I was designing for. And that, this is, I think, the difference. And I am working on this now. I'm not sure how well it's going to work out. We'll see. But I prefer radical openness and possibility because of its wide open perspective, right? And I think that equity could come from radical openness and possibility and a commitment to um, figuring out ways that people can be self-determining, right? And so I think that already in that has a kind of a definition, like an orientation towards a particular kind of politics, right? But it is also a freedom from oppression, right? And so I'm committed to those ideas, and I just wonder what might it look like to talk like that about people with whom we're working, rather than saying we're oriented towards equity. And then what I, so my student, Quentin, and I have tried, we've been writing, and we've been writing about equity and the ways in which like that's always changing like what is what does it mean now and like what does it mean in this historical context and now Donald Trump gets elected my god it's like I'm grateful to Donald Trump I will say that for helping me understand how historical circumstances like how history is unfolding and going and moving and it forces you to change your ideas about what your goals are and what new how contexts are changing all the time and it was like it's not like that wasn't happening all the time anyhow but when he came along everything exploded and changed for the communities I was I was working with right and so I think I'm trying to come up with a way of 
of not constantly saying we don't know what equity is because it's always changing, but just have a different concept. That could, and for me, you know, for other people, equity still may work really well because you have different goals. But for me, I feel like I'm oriented towards trying to push on the dynamic nature of our you know, lived experiences. Who is this young lady? So I'm going to play the um, wing woman role here and give you a little bit more credit um, for what I think you're doing. I think that part of the contribution of radical openness and possibility as an approach to equity is it's like decolonial. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's really, really deliberate in your work yeah. is that you are not coming in with a technical understanding of equity, with a preconceived missionary idea of this is what this community needs, but you are co-developing in really, really deliberate ways. And, and the part that you talked about, about listening, yeah. I mean, my God, why is there not more listening in, in all research? you know, to, to communities' needs and, and, and really ascertaining their assets. So I think, I think that there's more, and it's yep. more political, mm -hmm. what you're doing in terms of equity. And if you agree with me, you should talk more about that, because I think that's really one of the... It's cool the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I do think that. I mean, and I'm... I had to take, you know decolonial and colonizing and colonial project off of every slide when I like off of every page of this talk but that's definitely what I'm oriented towards and I think I haven't worked it out yet exactly what I want to say about that yeah yeah that. yeah I'm very tentative about using words before I feel like I really know what I'm talking about. I, but I feel like there has to be so much thinking. And I didn't say this, and it was in a different version, that so much of what I've learned, I mean, the gratitude slide was like a real slide, right? So much of what I've learned comes from writing and working and talking with other people. And so, you know, when I think about a grad student conference, that's a really important thing to remember. That my, like, best friend is sitting right here. I went to graduate school with her. We've been having these conversations. That's Lonnie Horn, for those of you who don't know. Um, we've been having these conversations forever. You know, my graduate advisor is right here. We've been talking about this forever. And my ideas are constantly developing. And I just wonder, like, how much, you know, we don't, I don't often see articles where people are like, let me think back on, like, who I've become through this work. And my, one of my mentors, the one who I, I didn't want to start with, Fred Erickson told me, within every theory lies a biography, but Fred Erickson was my postdoctoral mentor. And um, now I've lost my train of thought around that. What was I just saying, Quentin? Oh yeah, in the article that probably many of you know and have cited, like it's a qualitative uh, research, it's like 1986, Erickson, 1986, you should know that one, right? In there, there is a section on the natural history of inquiry, and I feel like people don't know how important that is. Like, he says every dot, you know, every study should include a section on the natural history of inquiry, and what that is, is like you writing about how you had some idea at the beginning of your project, and that thing changed over time, and you can document it because in your field notes or whatever data you were collecting, we can see how you started to think about that concept or whatever it was that you thought you were studying. We can see how it changed for you. And you should, that should happen for you because you should be learning. If you were not changing your ideas about things, you weren't learning anything, right? And so I feel like that's such an important idea but we rarely see evidence of it in any of the journal articles or talks. Or maybe you do hear it in a talk, but that's like ephemeral. I mean, we're not really documenting it so that we can make it legible to people in positions of power. So I, I mean, I feel like that's starting a new conference, but I really feel like <laughs> we should be talking about how we prepare people to do this work how we ourselves are still learning, 
and I don't mean to sound like that's like just so trite. We should be documenting that. If we study learning, we should be learning. And you should be surprised. And you should be wrong, significantly wrong, a lot of the time. I'm not ever wrong, but. <laughs> yeah. Rogers Hall, I see you shaking with the question. You got something to say? <laughs> or a comment? I want to know what you think. Just here to be supportive. My advisor. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, uh, I think we're in a really difficult historical moment mm -hmm. as a people, yeah. not just as a field. And so uh, I think we're all struggling with that. Yeah. We'll see if it improves. There have been difficult moments in the past, as we know, right? That's right. I mean, so taking a historical view of this, uh, we are not going to think the same way in the future. Right as we do now, we already don't think the same way that we did five years ago. So that, that's just kind of the nature of the thing that we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to go back to the STEM question because I'm a, you know, advocate and uh, crazy geek about those things. And um, I just, you know, I also am kind of sort of Lonnie's strategy, I also wanted to say there's this whole, there's this whole backstory that you're not telling us today, but I think is very important about the historical and material organization of conceptual change. Mm -hmm. So like one thread in the story you've told us today is the concept of promotores and where that comes from in Central and South America and how that ends up operating in Colorado in a really powerful way, but a new way. So part of the work that you're doing is also remediating the concept of promotores which then changes the food justice movement as well because the whole network to aspect of communication that you managed to build is in that. I think there's like a STEM angle on this from probably the information science people who helped you build the app. I mean, it's not super complicated technology, but it reorganizes the information ecology of that work in a way that's just fascinating. So you've also had an impact on those people. Uh, and that could be written about as well. So I think the kind of project you're involved in, you're in it around your own desires and interests, but that organization for work can support lots and lots of things uh, that we'll discover about learning. We still have things to discover about learning. Learning is not just an outcome of teaching. Learning has been organized historically in many, many different ways. I'm, watching Kate nod, and I know the problem you're grappling with. Like, what in the world does sailing have to do with physics? And why would you do that, right? So there's a lot yet to discover about learning, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful about that, and I'm ready to be thinking differently five years from now, and be thinking less orange five years from now. I want to 